YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Cast. Welcome back to another episode of Heart of the Cast. We finally, finally have our first uh, guest episode, and we have brought a new YC, a newly addition to your YCS uh, champion, uh, shall we say, bookcase, Mr. Pakawat here. How you doing, bro? Pretty good. Pretty good. I am uh, <laughs> wide awake, <laughs> full of adrenaline. So yeah, Pac like went. Today. Pac woke up extra early for us today. How how early yeah. is it? Like, uh, what what is it? Seven thirty almost. That's seven. Yeah. No, All it's right. not too bad. We don't have a unified time zone, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, events. Although some would believe that the only one that exists is Eastern Standard Time. So we're <laughs> uh, we're up bright and early here for uh for Pack, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're just gonna be talking about a little bit about the format, your win, your decision making. Um, prepped a bunch of questions and stuff to talk about your journey through uh the YCS and of course there's going to be a decent amount of I suppose uh room for maybe holding back on some specifics so I think we'll probably try to keep it a little bit general with regards to the format and kind of like the general topics of discussion that people have had just about like the concept of tier zero and the different viabilities of the different decks um mm -hmm. since naturally you're going to want to keep a lot of your uh your stuff on the download before this weekend which uh, who are your teammates by the way oh my god yo this is so crazy okay so I was supposed to team up with Sam and Steven. And I say was Wait, again? because, yes. Okay, I thought it would be really wholesome because Hell when yeah. I started playing the game, my first YCS ever, not like, it's not even like, this is like ever, right? Um, I went to Vegas with Sam and Steven. There's yeah, actually like a, a whole vlog at on... For context, right? It, there was the, they, they yeah. ran like a... Uh... Uh, a competition you had to submit an interview to team with sam and triff and then you you did that and then they picked you uh, and you guys got yep. 17th right Wait, was that was that before person? anyone like knew you and you just got in there with like a random uh, application yeah i'll just i got in with a random application i was just literally i was just like the average twitch viewer <laughs> like that i was is, just some no, that is guy. so funny that's i didn't really know you know they did that that that's not true. Yeah. You blew up with the with winning oh. a PPG regional. Okay, that, yeah, yeah, that, that was the true. pack breakout. Was a PPG regional. Okay, Farfetch yeah. just came with the entire pack origin story prepared. Okay, I don't know. I'm not. a I'm a big fan, dude. I I've got the lore. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't proud of that. It was like a ultra guest moments, but yeah, that's that's how I started my Yu-Gi-Oh journey. I uh, fakered a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> was that your first real deck? That was right when Electromite got banned at the start of December 2020. And I remember this vividly because Electromite was my soul day, my Promethean princess. It was like that one car that like just made me love Yu-Gi-Oh! And then she got banned. So, of course, I naturally had to uh, go to the dark side. And then Normal Summon Melusik was uh, the next <laughs> logical step, I guess. <laughs> I can definitely see the relation there. Okay, so just for like a uh, brief introduction, which I think is something we should probably do whenever we have a guest on, uh, or for some people, which uh, I'm sure it's not many, but if, if someone doesn't know who you are, uh, like how long have you been playing and uh, what did you do so far in your time in this game? Yeah, so I started playing right towards the end of 2019. Um, and I guess like, in like the the four years I, I've been playing, uh, which like and you know there's like two years of COVID <laughs> uh, in between all of this. Um, I guess I won three YCSs, uh, one remote duel, uh, which was the first remote duel event, and then I won two three v three YCSs. Uh, really looking, f I, I really want to win my solo one, so that's like my next step, and then and go to worlds in terms of like goals for like the game. Um, and then I guess yeah, like, maybe like you know. Konami tops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, slow and steady, you know. I I'm trying to. Trying to get on Josh's level. No, but, uh, no, yeah, look, so. no, no. Th this is specifically why I asked this question. I wanted you to introduce yourself because I, I, I think it's one of the um, most, like, one of the most insane, I want to say, stories from, like, modern Yu-Gi-Oh, honestly. Like, uh, I, I, whenever I think of, whenever I face these discussions of, like, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh is so hard to get into or, like, impossible to keep up with, uh like uh, in the modern game or like get into the modern game if you haven't been playing forever um i i always refer to you as like the one person who's really been not in the game for that long i mean like four or five years is a long time but like not as long as a lot of other successful players in the game uh 
are and i i, I just think the the dedication and the work you put into the game in the last couple of years and the way it's paid off for you is one of my favorite you know things to think about when it comes to to modern Yu-Gi-Oh in the last couple of years and um because i i i know you I've, i talk to you when it comes to tournament prep and all that kind of thing i know the work you put in and the yeah. the results it's 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 given to you is something that is um it is one of the things that keeps me motivated as well in in like modern Yu-Gi-Oh and always shows okay there's people there's people rapidly catching up to you know or like maybe even overtaking uh us in the levels that we are at and uh i think it's very um it's very cool to have you on and very cool to have you as a player in the game i appreciate that i appreciate that that means a lot thank you well speak for yourself josh in terms of being overtaken here. I'm, still, uh, I'm, st I'm still on fire out here i, uh, but I, I think yeah, no the, you have uh, not been overtaken i think i, I you probably were sure. yeah it's probably been like that the entire time but uh the uh the coolest thing as well you know don't forget like you say like four or five years but there was like no events for like a good portion of that so that is true i mean yeah this like yeah. the speed at which you've advanced is like truly incredible uh and really impressive um and i think as well one of the uh, most important things that i do like to highlight to people as well because there's a lot of people who like get to the dedication that you you are at they might not see that same success but they really sacrifice a lot in terms of their health their personal life um and you are someone who's a pretty normal right <laughs> like you have a stable <laughs> job you got good income you know you take care of yourself um uh, and that's important right people don't really get that life balance sometimes um i see a lot of especially mm -hmm. younger duelists just throw themselves into Yu-Gi-Oh. uh like literally you know 10 plus hours a day grinding on the old uh, uh train app and stuff like that it's uh <laughs> like it's unhealthy and i think you've done a pretty good job at balancing that as well which is really impressive yeah no thank you thank you i appreciate all the compliments um no honestly i'm just i just fell in love with the game so it makes it easier to like um you know train and, and play and then i also made a lot of really good friends i think without them it would be way harder um to like stay so integrated with with Oh. but yeah i'm honestly just like super addicted <laughs> to this game <laughs> um and um i don't know yeah but I, I do my best to balance everything so it's not too bad i'm curious what it is it like about Oh specifically like was it just the first card game you picked up did you ever trade like pokemon or something in 2019 mm. like why why did you gravitate towards this one over anything else yeah so the origin story is my first card game was actually hearthstone and i like love that game i played that game a lot good choice, uh, good choice. like you know i made like legend a couple times uh like first in legend a couple times i played that like you got Hearth, one legend like, yeah oh, <laughs> but, but that was when like but I was playing like Face Hunter and stuff. It was just super cringe. But um, I mean, Frank and... One is still pretty impressive, right? Uh, like... No, no, no. You could not waterboard that information out of me. <laughs> With <laughs> Face Hunter, dude. With Face Hunter, bro. dude. Guys bro, just admitted like... to Eldritch being his favorite deck, you know? Yeah, basic. Not bro, yeah. the, the four two board, bro. Swing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that was that was great. I I love that. It was so much fun. And then. Uh, after I graduated college, I met up with a friend from high school, um, and he was doing really well. He was a really good close friend of mine, and funny enough, he's actually the owner of Gamer's Choice. So, and he and I just like met for lunch, and we kind of just chatted about you know where we're at in life, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm about to start this job, um, and, and like and all this stuff, and he's like, bro, I've been selling Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and I'm like. I'm like, no way, you're, you're joking. He's like, yeah, I've been selling yu gi for like the past like four years, five years, whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, how has it been? He, and he just said how well he was doing. So I got interested, right? I have like a small break before I start my actual job. And I took this time to kind of like work under him. And I learned it. I learned how to like vent pretty much, like how to spy and sell Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Um, but I didn't really understand how to play the game. So I was like, this is kind of weird. Like, how am I buying and selling cards without, re like, knowing what these cards do? So I was like, you know what? Vendor. Let's give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> I literally gave it a try. I went on YouTube. I literally typed in, like, best budget deck. Literally best budget deck at the oh, time. Oh, you typed and... in the word best. We know who's popping up <laughs> on the algorithm. <laughs> My boy Team Samurai X1 out here <laughs> with three Salomon Great Structure decks. And, and at the time, like, three Salomon Structure decks were you know low-key like kind of nasty so 
that's kind of like my introduction to you guys. I just played three Salamigrate. I had no idea what I was doing. I watched like Simo's video on how to link summon. Um, <laughs> and because I mean, bro, that like that mechanic did really make sense. Like if you have never played Yu Gi Oh ever, um, and was it then like forty minutes or something as well. <laughs> yes, I was like, okay, like because think about it, like using a link one and a link four to summon a link three obviously is illegal, but. Like, it didn't make sense. Like, I didn't understand, like, how you... Uh, anyways, well, I understand now. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I'm glad you clarified it now, you know. I mean, to, nowadays, um, it's all just... it's all It all makes terahertz, dude. Yeah. No, no matter yeah. what. Like, the math is not math anymore. It's not one plus four no more. It's just, like, you know, a freaking... Oh. A chip and a a chip and a piece of... Uh, a piece of something. Yeah. A piece of paper makes uh, terahertz. It's yeah, then, interesting because then, you came into a time where I would say like it was a good format, right? Like it would have been pretty curious if you had joined the game in like, you know, a notoriously like bad format or something, you know? Um, yeah. I'm curious if that would have changed or shifted uh, your perspective at all. Um, but yeah, so you started in 2019 and I think three Salomon Great Structure decks with maybe a bunch of staples literally got top eight at YCS Dortmund of that year. I recall very specifically yeah. an example of this, of uh, a younger duelist. Uh, who literally mm -hmm. topped with three structure decks and some staples, like cheap staples. Um, so so that, that was like the, like, I want to say like golden age in terms of the finances of uh, competitive. <laughs> yeah. To, uh, to get in. Now, <laughs> now it's three, one to three bonfires, I'm saying. Foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, so what was the uh, step to... Uh, the competitive side right because like obviously you you know there's there's one thing to optimize and play and get better but then I, th I feel like a lot of like the top end players they sort of end up having this sort of eureka clicking moment where you kind of go from like all right let's try and optimize and be really good to all right we're gonna like fully like throw ourselves into this competitive sphere and engulf ourselves with just the upper echelons of Yu-Gi-Oh theory and deck building and circles and mm -hmm. all of this stuff that is Kind of like a, a a stage ahead of kind of the average competitive, if you know what I mean. Yep. Yeah, it all started for me, I guess, because I my I randomly went. My friend invited me to go to this the like the PBG national event. Keep in mind, I don't even have an invite. I've never been to a PBG before. I um got addicted. I got so addicted to Yu Gi Oh in the first three months of playing at the end of 19, 2019 that I started watching a lot of Yu Gi Oh feature matches. Um, like whether it's from, you know, various companies, right? Um, like either Konami or Fisher or not. And I really just like, I, I was like, you know what? I want to play one of these one day. Um, my friend uh, told me about this, like uh tournament that was happening and yeah, I just flew out with him. Um, and it was at like that, I think, I guess like PPG national tournament that I ended up winning. Like, I, I don't, I don't even know how I like, I like somehow beat full power spiral um with like basically alter guys and that Imprint for me like Faker, baby yeah funny enough i never drew it and the one time i ever did draw him from freaker in that format because figures that one i lost uh, we won't talk about <laughs> that but <laughs> um but yeah and, and that, that was kind of like I, a bunch of like good players like kind of like scouted me or, per se like um like honey told me he like noticed me at that event and then the the event after that was YCS Vegas, where I did the um interview with or like the interview with Sam and and how I got in, and that was when like after I got 17 at Vegas, uh, I guess like more people took took like note of me. Um, and I just started after that. It was like COVID, and during the COVID era, there wasn't really a lot of events that were going on. But I like started a YouTube channel and the Twitch channel, and that time I was kind of like just documenting my journey on like how to improve at the game. Um, and I, it's so funny cause I have like my old DB account and I look back at some of these replays and it was atrocious how bad I was. Like I look back and I'm like, dude, what was I doing? Um, especially like when you see like bo both hands, but yeah, that was kind of like the, the step for me. And I just kind of like grinded during, um, the COVID era, like either playing remote duels, playing like against other, like, you know, tournaments and stuff like that. And that, that like, I think that like really pushed it, um, to like the next step for me and i met a lot of players that were coming back to the game during that time like gunther for example was one of like the first people i met i mean cam one of the first people cam, cam the man neil uh, one of the first people i met uh when i got into competitive Yu Gi Oh, because uh, they actually like gunther would tell me that he actually watched my channel to get back into the game uh in 2020 
Um, and that's kind of like how we, and I got invited to like this Discord uh, with them, and then that's how we became like really good friends. Wait, Gunther was um, gone. So, yeah, after after COVID happened, Gunther stopped playing Yu-Gi-Oh completely. And when oh. they announced the first remote duel YCS in 2021, he kind of like got back into the game. And so like he and I, he, me, and like a bunch of other people got in like Discord, and we started training for it. Mm-hmm. Um. And of course, like I honestly, whenever I train with Gunther for Wises, it just like I usually like do really well. So honestly, shout out to Gunther. <laughs> but yeah, Weird. and then that's kind of like how we became really good friends. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think it's uh, you know, it's it becomes like Discord official. That's how you know that you've got that circle, right? Like it's like when you uh, update yeah. your relationship status on Facebook, right? Like this is the Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> like, yeah. You get the Yu-Gi yeah. circle on Discord. Um. Yeah, pretty much. Should we start talking about, uh, I guess, a little bit about where we're at just now in terms of the format in the game? Yeah, I, I think we can shift a little bit towards the, the modern day, the stuff that's happening right now. And obviously, it's a format that you are familiar with as you've just won the, the 3v3 YCS. Um, yeah. My side quest for today is getting as much information out you as possible because you said, like, you know, there's <laughs> some things... There are some things that you're going to, like, that you don't want to mention because there's another YCS mm-hmm. coming up the the upcoming weekend um but yeah i think i think there are some things we can probably talk about because it's not everything is is super hidden obviously right um yep. and some information is already out there obviously this was like the first big weekend of like phantom nightmare events we've had one weekend of like regionals before that but this one was the one where we had um your 3v3 ycs as well as the undisputed uds championship so we saw a lot of the uh, high caliber players and what kind of decks they have taken to the event so maybe you t- walk us through like the process of deciding which deck to play for the event obviously um what you played and so on and so forth mm-hmm. yeah so uh i honestly thought there were uh three choices for the ycs so you either play a fire deck which is uh between rescue ace um between um the fire king version and then the pure version mm-hmm. Uh, you either play voiceless, uh, which I think is like super strong. Like people think I'm like trolling when I say that I think that deck is super scary. Like I was super prepped for that deck, and that's how Gunther was knocked out in top 16. Like the voiceless deck was, like it when it goes first, like and wins the roll, it, you, it can be very hard to beat. And sometimes it can high roll hands that like beat every in, um, hand trap. So it's like super suspect, like to like you know win. Um, and then the third choice is like some sort of shifter deck. You either play Kashira, you either play Fluanderese. I like never gravitate towards those type of decks because I feel like there's no skill expression because there's like two actions per per turn <laughs> in terms of those strategies. Uh, so like you don't really get to like if you if you're like consider yourself to be a better player, you don't really have much decision making um, or influence in those type of strategies. So I'm like those decks are just like out the door for me. So then it I became that, like a decision. Uh, term, sorry, I just no, want to like make some context for uh, for listeners because they might not be sure exactly what that means. But when you say skill expression. Um, I assume, like, generally what you're referring to is you look at your opening hand, uh, you only really have logically maybe two or three lines. Um, and so yeah. a deck with sort of a high amount of skill expression is a, is a hand that would have, you know, all kinds of different directions you can take. And mm-hmm. those decision making trees between a good player and a really good player, um, you express yourself by picking those lines that beat specific hand traps or specific board states. Whereas when you play a lower ceiling deck like something like Fluander and Kashtira, you're going to be completely limited and pretty much at the mercy of whether or not your opponent just has the out to those singular or even the two lines that your hand can really do, right? Yep. No, totally agree. Um, and yeah, and then, then after that became a decision between Voiceless and the Fire decks, I quickly crossed out uh, decks like Rescue Ace, mainly because of like the inherent amount of like bricks it had to play in order to... Uh, be viable strategy i think that in a tournament where like you are trying to have the highest win rate possible you just cannot afford bricks um and that was also why i decided to and it's so funny you say bricks but that that was the reason why i decided to not play the fire king variants i decided to play the pure uh, snake eye variant because i believe that like it's very hard to break a board going second and i don't think fire king cards contribute you to breaking boards I think like the reason why people can break boards is because people aren't um they're still learning the decks like they're still learning the fire deck so like you're having these like chances to like win when you shouldn't 
Uh, but I think that when you play against someone else of like a high caliber, and especially when you're like in the top cut of like a YCS, it's very difficult to break your opponent's board with like Far King Island or like Kieran. Um, and where I think those cards are like mainly only good for going first. And so I decided to play the pure variant to have the highest chance to win game one because I think that in the current format, uh, when you get to like the post sided games, it gets really hard to win. Um, and the reason why I say that is because of floodgates, you know. Konami addressed a bunch of floodgates on the last limit, semi-limited list, or like the forbidden limited list, but they didn't like hit a lot of cards like anti-spell, summon limit, um, that are still like very big problems um, for for like the game. Um, and so as a result, like the game one is like I think one of the most important games in in modern Yu-Gi-Oh because the you have initiative in game three to go first with floods, which is like pretty much like a like your win rate goes like up like you know skyrockets. Um, and then the issue is when your opponent gets to go second, they can have upwards of like 20 plus non-engine. Uh, so like when you go first, it's like very unlikely that you even win. So it's just like the game one is like so important. Um, and and so like that's what I, I wanted to prioritize when I was entering this YCS. Um, and I didn't play voices only because my issue with the deck is that like it has like it has like Kestira hands. And what I mean by that is it either opens like really <laughs> broken or it loses to one hand trap. Um, and Kestira hands classics. Yeah. Know, <laughs> five spells yeah, or uh, all gas or just like <laughs> multiples of like. Yeah. yeah. You think it's really consistent, but if you count them out of non engine relative to your engine, it's like really not that consistent um, because a lot of like your ways to play the game aren't that high. Um, and for what it does with one card compared to what Snake Eye does with one card, it's just like there's no, it's a no brainer to then like go with the Snake Eye deck. That's how I decided to play the Snake Eye deck ultimately, at least the pure, pure variant. Yeah. You mentioned uh, three Snake Eye decks in the way of Rescue Ace, Pure, and Fire King. Is there is there anything else at all that's viable? Um, I looked into like Volcanics. I looked into like. Uh, nice. uh, like Salomon Great because I actually think Salomon Great uh, can also be like a really solid strategy because like you non ironic like the one Ash Blossom is like I think like eight interruptions but it, that's like any deck but in the Salad deck specifically like you get to relink Pyro Phoenix which I think is like so funny um, and you can even do it without the field spell because like you give them uh, you give them a, a Salad monster like one of the new ones does it and then like you trigger Princess to like summon itself back and pop it so you can literally relink raging phoenix without the field spell like that's how many mod that's how many cards that's how much card advantage you get from like a snake eye ash um but i like i just think that a lot of those decks have a lot of like weaknesses um where i just think that the reason why any fire deck is even good or remotely good at all is because of the snake eye cards so i just wanted to only play the best high quality cards possible which is just the pure snake eye cards like those are just like those are the reason why uh, any fire deck is viable. Like, um, you know, like I don't really want to tap my engine into any other engine because I just believe that like the uh, thing I engine is the best engine, in my opinion. So, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And another small thing you mentioned about the floodgates and the whole game game one uh, being the most important one is 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 also very true and also something we've talked about before. Like, I I I, I don't necessarily think like I I think best of three is a great thing. But I don't necessarily think the side deck nowadays does what it was meant to to like to do or originally when it was like designed, you know, 20, 20 plus mm -hmm. years ago. Because like nowadays, a lot of side decking is just like you know basically customizing your deck to be as broken and unfair as possible, whether it's going first or second. <laughs> and, so, and so like yes. you're like, okay, I I know I can go first now, so I'm gonna throw these ten auto win buttons into my deck or whatever. I'm I'm exaggerating, but like you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I know I don't have to worry about anything, you know, I can just put cross out, called by, anti-spell into my deck, and then I know I'm going to go second now, so now I'm going to have, instead, I'm going to either have, like, 20 hand traps, or I'm going to have yep. evenly Dark Ruler, all that, all those blowout cards, you know? Um, which sometimes really makes it so that game one is not only super important, but it's also often the one where, like, the best Yu-Gi-Oh is being played, because neither player has yeah. those cards in their main deck most of the time right um no, so period. playing like the most consistent version of your deck possible uh and even fitting the most amount of those cards that you would normally side deck into your main deck is um is really something right yeah um no, totally agree. uh you didn't publishize your deck list right 
Yeah, I didn't publicize my deck list. I worked okay. with a lot of like uh I worked with like um Gunther, Walter, uh, you know, Luca, I'm on, on the list. Um and I worked with uh that those are like my main main testing partners and so uh, they're gonna be playing the YCS this weekend as well. So I, I told them before, even if we won anything, that we would uh, hold the deck list till after because um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do you innovate um, and how do you get an edge in a format where everyone's playing the same deck and the same cards. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we did a really good job of of getting that edge. Um, and and I think uh, it's only fair just to like maintain it uh, for them as well um, leading up to this weekend. But we did really did put a lot of time. I think this was the longest. This was probably the earliest I've ever tested for a YCS. Mm-hmm. After Bologna, I literally went into the lab with all of them at the start of like December, after, like after December. So I honestly been working with these guys for like the past two months. And so um, I, I hope I hope, you know, they do really well this weekend as well. Um, so. so you basically you took all that downtime that we had in Yu-Gi-Oh for the last like, what is it, six weeks, eight weeks or whatever? even longer yeah. than that and just uh you know yeah okay that's that's nice so would you say would you say it was mostly about you approached the deck differently in terms of how you built it or how you mm-hmm. actually piloted it like what was the difference is that is, are we expecting a list with stuff that's unexpected and uncommon or is it more like how you were using the cards how you were playing around other cards mm-hmm. in the format I think it's both. I don't think any cards you see in my deck is going to be uncommon, funny enough. I think it's like, under, like you have to kind of like pick, okay, how do you want to win in this game, right? Like, yeah. there's two approaches yeah. in the current format. You either go uh, hand traps or board breakers. But I think the mistake people are making is they don't full send either approach. I think <laughs> yeah. like they kind of like go half and half. Like, you yeah. know, they go like, you know, I'm going to play like nine hand traps and then like three super poly, three droplets, yeah. three talents or something like that. And it's yeah. like, I think in this format, you have to commit. Yeah. Um, and I think the uh, in terms of playing, like the first approach that I took to the format was looking at the standard combo. It was like understanding what everyone was doing and then seeing, and then after that, doing it myself and seeing like all the possibilities, um, you know, that is out there. And like when I started like redoing all the combos with all the guys, I realized that like uh, there are ways to like improve the combo even with one Snake Eye Ash, um, and then there's ways to like improve the combo even with like one Witch. And I think like that's kind of like the edge in terms of like I know I know what every board people are gonna make because of like these are like the quote unquote standard combos, and I know like what board I should make with these cards to beat what everyone else like has in their decks. And I mm-hmm. think like that was like the approach we did and. Yeah, it, it it worked like really well because it's like I understand like you know I already know what boards people are making so I like pretty much like knew what to expect I guess but I guess they yeah. didn't expect the boards we were making yeah yeah I think it's an... pretty uh, impressive from a testing perspective to uh, first of all that far in advance you you it's interesting because you you have to play test in a in a way where you are creating normal standard mm-hmm. end boards and standard deck lists. And then you have to play test further beyond that to yep. actually counter the standard. And then, you know, so it's almost like this 4D chess that's always happening between uh, testing sessions to, you know, constantly stay yeah. one step ahead. So it's pretty impressive the amount of work and time and effort that gets put into something like that. So uh, I can't wait to see which direction you've taken this thing in, especially uh, with uh, noting that even just one bell star can be a, a different line altogether. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you think like Ash and Diablo, I guess, to the same point, but there's like ways we like innovated to like make it different, which is like crazy. But yeah, you'll see. I think I'm working with it will be out this Sunday, I believe. Gunther's mm-hmm. working on the combos right now and, and showcasing it. So so be on the lookout for that. Ooh, that's the um, that's the the Gunther collab you've been teasing. Yeah, yeah. So Gunther and I are gonna collaborate on um pretty much showcasing the approaches we took to the deck. I'm gonna mm-hmm. showcase the deck building aspect and Gunther will showcase like the combo aspect. Um and and pretty much so you understand like what we were doing from a tech play perspective and then yeah. how we came to the deck yeah uh yeah something you something you said i picked up on that i think is is really interesting especially and it's gotten a lot more like this in modern Yu-Gi-Oh a lot of the time and it's very very obvious in the current format or very pre- relevant in the current format is this sort of full send approach right like you would it used to be a very common thing to play a couple hand traps and a couple good like spell cards for going second, you know, pair it up a little bit. 
Um, and I think that can still work in certain environments in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Because sometimes, mm. I think the way you have to look at it is what what purpose the hand traps serve in your deck in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Because there are formats where I'm putting hand traps into my deck to, for example, make my opponent end on something like a half board, you know? Like, I, I just want to mm -hmm. prevent some very crucial choke points, like... Uh, one example from the early days of maybe when you were playing was you could, for example, choose to use your impermanence against Salamangrate to prevent them from sending the trap card with Gazelle, right? And that would yep. make it so they would still end on whatever, but they would not be able to, and they, they, they had no way to access the trap card. And so you know, you knew, yep. okay, I'm going to have to grind with them. I'm not going to stop them completely, but I'm not going to have to face the trap card, right? Um, and yep. then the other the other side of the coin essentially is the purpose of hand traps can also be I want to stop my opponent from playing completely, right? Uh, and yeah. in, in that uh, yeah. in that instance, for example, your opponent goes normal summon lady debug. You throw your imperm first in instance, like in the same format example, right? Uh, you would try yeah. to imperm that lady debug and just hope they don't have a single extender and they just pass the turn, right? Which is the more like I I want to say usually higher risk, higher reward kind of style, right? Because like, um, yeah. Uh, the uh, the the risk of uh, the risk of them just having an extender and you are imperm basically doing nothing is obviously higher than the risk of when you because when you imperm the gazelle they're always gonna miss something. Um, and in the current format, yeah. I think we are in a situation where most people that play hand traps against the fire deck, from what I've seen, the goal is make them pass turn right. Like I'm gonna throw yep. one hand trap at you. If you have one extender, I better have a second hand trap and um. And if I have two hand traps, it's actually quite likely I can make you pass the turn, right? It's not like... And the Snake Eye deck also isn't very good at making half boards, I, I would argue, through hand traps. Because it's either either you get there or you don't, right? And, um, mm -hmm. and then uh, it doesn't really make sense to play board breakers with your hand traps then. Because um, if, you, if you hand trap your opponent, they pass without anything. You're not going to have a live talents. You're not going to have a, a target for your Cosmic Cyclone. You're not going to have... They, they're not going to have monsters for your Super Follies. Or whichever you play, right? Um, and it basically, at that point, you're saying like, if they if they push through my hand traps, they win the game anyways. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's what that's what you have to do, and I think that's what feels bad, right? That's what feels bad to people. They're like, what what if I draw imperm uh, and it's not enough, and then I don't even play any board breakers? But in reality, I don't mm -hmm. think you get a higher win rate by trying to make your deck do everything, right? I'm gonna have enough hand traps to stop them from playing and then i'm also gonna have enough board breakers to break a board if they make one uh it's just not something that that's feasible i don't think nope <clears throat> i totally agree yeah that was like an analysis we we made too it's like you know yeah. i think you have to like really go in all all in on your approaches yeah. um so i agree yeah I don't know how much you paid attention to the UDS and uh, some of the deck lists because obviously you were playing. Um, but they did actually yeah. publish the deck. I don't know if it was Konami specifically that just released deck list because it's an official event. Yeah. It might, uh, it might have been. Um, or no, rather official event. But they usually sometimes just decide to post the deck yeah, list. Yeah, I took so. a look at the list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes in the middle event, which is crazy, but <laughs> that's uh, that's a different point. Um, I'm just curious, like, what you thought about the uh, the other decks that were playing, and I'm maybe specifically referring to uh, Juan Andrade, who got second. Uh played really mm. really well um and yep. i i was a big fan of his, his list you know there was some really cool cards yeah. in there like enemy controller um i'm not sure if you had any thoughts on uh his yeah, approach to yeah. Pure snake eye yeah sure i think he took like the half approach that i talked yeah, about did, that yeah. i didn't like and i also say that i think he played 44 cards um yeah. i would i think personally you'd have you have to play 40 cards i played 41 i trolled i added one card last minute don't ask me I trolled. why <laughs> Um, but I <laughs> I had a really good theory for it. I'll I'll say what card it is actually. It's actually not bad. It's Monster Reborn. I added Monster yeah. Reborn to my deck um last minute to make it 41. Um and I did Mark. it because I won with Prank Kids with that same Monster Reborn in my deck. The so, same one, same copy. The same exact one. Yeah, I cracked the PSA case for this. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> Whoa. Dude, that's so, insane. <laughs> I cracked the PSA case. Uh, for my prank kid deck back oh, in the oh, is remote. so I took the same one. I'm like, you know what? I I want to do it again with this card. And um, funny enough, I did three. I did six card comboed my opponent. Um, <laughs> in top sixteen, he like nib me. Did all he nib Ash imper me? I have one card in hand. He's like, he's like, what is it? It can't be one for one. It can't be witch. It can't be Ash. I'm like monster reborn. Target your Ash. And then yeah, he he, he like full combo. That turn. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was the 41st card. But I think, okay, so back to my point of like, I really think it has to be 40 because if you count the amount of engine cards you have, like it's very important you do this, you'll realize it's like literally 50 engine, 50 non-engine. Um, uh, it, it's like, cash, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's the same level as Kashir in terms of consist- inconsistency, but you'll have hands that have one play. Like you, you need to yeah. really like stay close to 40 as possible. And like, you need to draw those like impactful cards. Like you need yeah. to draw like, like the Ash Witch combinations. Like you need to draw like the Bonfire Ash Witch. Like, yeah. so I think the 44 was a little too high for, for my preference um, because the quality of the cards are very like, you know what I'm saying? Like once a Snake Eye Ash versus a Bonfire, it's very important. Like it's it's more important to draw Ash than it is to draw a Bonfire. Like, I, or uh, it's also important to draw any one of them. So just yeah. play 48 in my opinion. Yeah. So yeah, those, those are, that's my takeaway. I, it's guess. The, I, I wouldn't say the deck is inconsistent as it is, but it definitely has a limit as to how many good openers like you can play and uh yep. it's very dangerous i think to go over there are decks where it's no problem like you know you want uh like you there's examples in in recent history of the game where there were decks where if you just wanted to maybe draw your engine requirements a little less often you could easily go over 40 by just upping the amount of engine and non-engine by equal amounts which just ends up making your deck pretty much the same level of consistent just less bricks right like dragon link is a deck where yep. that was not too hard to just find them find Helen some more that dragon link was more consistent and optimal at 60 than 40 sometimes i mean i don't know exactly <laughs> but like yeah. there, it was definitely a, a, a an issue where you can just add more starter cards like you can add a secondary normal summon to your dragon link deck and then you can add some more hand traps and then you end up with roughly the same ratios in terms of your opening hands but you have you now have a deck that draws um one of branded beast less often for example right snake eye doesn't Can have you, the ability uh, elaborate to do a little that, bit more on like. what you mean by ratios because i think it's important that people understand what this means and why going above 40 isn't always necessary correct if you could maybe just explain uh, the, uh, okay I'm, when i said ratios i meant like you want to make sure your expected opening hand i want to i want to call it that has the like right amount of cards you need to play like for example if you play a 60 card deck and you only have your three starter cards in there right you there's no the the expected amount of of them you're gonna see in five is basically zero right you're gonna you're not gonna open it right and so that's what we do in deck building we try to make the deck as consistent as possible we look at statistics for like you know, i mean not everyone looks at the specific statistics people develop like a feeling for it i i, I shall say right but like you look at the amount of starters compared to as well how many do you need to see like it's important to differentiate between decks that only need to see one card out of five to play and decks that try to operate on a full engine hand right that's why typically you know one deck that i've been playing a lot recently that's why like runic decks don't have any sort of room for for non-engine because the runic deck in order to pull off its combos or its strongest turns like it wants to draw two to three runics plus another card like my deck doesn't have room to or maybe it maybe it has room to play eight non-engine but i i don't want to i don't want to open it that much right yeah yeah josh not yeah. mentioned runic challenge impossible i know i know it's just <laughs> it's a good yeah, example for modern Yu Gi Oh deck building because it's so different than other things yeah, yeah. no runic is like you want to draw a full engine hands for sure yeah, exactly. like if you don't like if you have ash blossom in your hand your hand's terrible like going first in like the runic deck it's like damn do i pitch this ash like probably <laughs> like yeah. um but yeah for sure uh you mentioned a little bit about voices voice earlier uh was there any particular decks that you heavily sided for um i think Quan specifically oh, yeah. in his interview mentioned like he was really really prepared for um uh branded which is why he sided like things like foolish return like just to deal with the uh mm. the, now, the juan was not prepared stuff. for branded juan was prepared for andres torres specifically <laughs> He's like, <"That's> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's so funny yeah um I was prepped for like voiceless. I think that deck is like really strong. Um, I played three voices in the tournament. I beat all of them, um, but I was just very prepared for the deck. Uh, and so, like, I yeah, I like beat this guy through sub limit. Even it was crazy. But um, ah, I, I think what? like, what is your deck list like? I didn't see this now. <laughs> I mean, I just stopped my opponent, Did and then I just upgraded the summon limit pretty much. 
Yo, yo, funny enough, I didn't side cosmic at all. I had okay. no back removal. I guess I'll leave this that. This is turning I, into I like uh, Triff I tweets. Remember that YCS <laughs> when he was like, yeah, Droll Shifter? Uh, damn, I guess I lose. Duo, baby, let's go. Like, this is exactly <laughs> what you're yeah. right now. Nah, I played like no back removal because like I think that like you better draw those floods and then like if I stop you, it doesn't matter if you have the flood up. Like I can set up a lot of advantage even under like there was one game I saw my pony flip anti spell and almost something ash and he he like got OTK that same turn. Like yeah. I that think is... that uh, the f yeah it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's only seven limit that can like stop you. So. That is one of the biggest yep. downsides, I think, of anti-spell fragrance in a format where like the 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 most popular deck plays twelve, fifteen plus hand traps. It's like. Well, yep. technically, the Snake Eye deck has some cards that suffer from anti-spell, but not all of them do. Like, if they Imper and Baylor you yeah. and then Normal Summon Snake Eye Ash, like, you you still die if you didn't set up anything and have no other non-engine on, on your own. So, like, even, yeah. even opening anti-spell plus combo against the Hand Trap Snake Eye deck is no guarantee to get you there. Mm -hmm. It was um the most, the scariest deck at the event, honestly, was actually Branded Voiceless. And I played two of that. Um, and it was, that deck is crazy, bro. Like, this guy goes Brand Fusion, right? Summons Lubellion. I'm like, hmm, Imperm. He goes Chains to Ravius. I'm like, bro, what? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I literally looked at him, I'm like, wait, huh? And then I noticed his graveyard. I'm like, yo, there's a Saphir in the grave. And so I was like, yo, this guy going oh, crazy right now. They sent Saphira for Branded Fusion to Ritual Summon with yeah. him? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so like the combo, like they go like Branded Fusion, send Saphira, uh, send Albaz, summon Albion, Albion into Lubellion, and then Lubellion discard a card to make Mirror Jade. Um, and then the extra Albion on the board can then be uh, utilized to like make like a, uh, you know, uh, like like a ritual summon. Rituals like fodder, yeah, because it's bigger level yeah. than the yeah. Okay. Yep, because only the rituals, only the ritual spell requires specifically light monsters. Um, but uh, Saphira just says, yeah, just just tribute me. So yeah. <laughs> just tribute me. Tribute me. Yeah. Uh, ignoring the biases that come with the uh, format I top and do well in is good format. Format I don't mm. do good in is bad format. <laughs> Um, yeah. How, have you actually <laughs> been like saying? Uh, how, do you actually feel and think that this is like a good format? Do you think there's like it's a good mirror? Or, like, are you pretty happy with the dynamic, or do you think there's still significant issues? Obviously, I think the major ones you mentioned is game two and three can turn into a lot of non games, yeah. but I don't think that's a format issue. I think that's a Yu Gi Oh issue. Um, but in general, yeah. yeah. Do you do you think it's like it's it's been pretty good? Um, I think this is always the case. So I can, I don't even know if this is format specific. I think this format. And it's giving me a hot take. I think it's gonna get pretty bad. Like I think it's pretty <laughs> awful. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because like I think like once people understand how to actually play their decks and like build their board correctly, I think the game gets really like toxic. Like they're I, like I genuinely don't think you can win going second ever. Like in, in this format, like it's so hard. Um, but but I think that like people give opportunities for players to get back in the game. Like one wrong princess utilize like activation and all of a sudden i have like three monsters like and you're and you're staring down like me raging phoenix otking you you know what i'm saying like I, I think that like people do give opportunities for you to have chances when you shouldn't um which i think is um you know that's always part of the game but i think when you get to like the higher caliber players like i i already knew in my head that like if i if i played gunther in top eight if he didn't get knocked out in top 16 like, it was going to be coin flip, like, whether or not we make it. And then whoever does well there, I think, could, like, honestly win the YCS. So um, when Gunther got completely sacked in top 16, I was like, man, I think it's actually possible for us to do well. Um, because it's less coin flippy versus people who, like, aren't as prepared. Because the average person, like, just don't have time to, like, play tests, right? Like, they just, which is fair. Like, you have other things to do. Um, so were you were rooting against but, your homies, what you're saying. That's crazy. No, no, no. I was really sad. I was really sad he <laughs> lost. I, I, I told him, like, yo, I'll see you top eight. And, like, just no. no and I'm then joking, I think joking, it's just curse when. Yeah, it's curse when you say that because, like, y'all said the same thing to me at, like, Bologna. He's like, y'all see me in the finals. And I'm, like, literally, like, getting completely, like, like destroyed by Ace. I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, see you in the crowd <laughs> watching <laughs> the match. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think, like, You'll realize that like it's not thing, as right? tough as you like. Think. Don't don't you don't you think yeah. that that's a good thing? Like I think like the so it sounds like to me and correct me if I'm wrong. The way you're describing it's like if everyone 
plays and fully optimizes their their lines uh, in every game one perfectly, mm -hmm. then you don't stand a chance, right? But yep. in theory, that's every duel, right? Um, regardless yeah. of how good the format it's, is. So I think yeah. because there is yeah. an inability for a lot of players to identify those correct lines, then surely that it is a good format by proxy because the people who put in the more time and will just be better, yeah. right? So so surely that's a good thing. They, I guess it is a good thing. I think it's just bad because like I just keep playing like you know like you constantly play against like people who are like like really strong. So it's just like you know I'm like it's like damn bro like this is this is terrible. I'm like dude we're comparing hands, but then. When you get to the actual white says, obviously it's not like that at all. Yeah. But like leading up to the white says, I'm like, bro, I'm comparing hands with my homie out here. Like we're just <laughs> like, it's actually just like, you know, but I guess mm. like, you know, I guess if everyone plays optimally, like the same players never do well ever again. So I guess like maybe that's fine. But yeah, I just think, I mean, no, it's maybe a, I just want to consistently win the top, the top 0. <laughs> 0, 0, 0, 1 yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. player base, right? I, th I think um, what you're saying does make sense. I think I, I, mm. I think I, I see what you're saying, and uh, but I also see where you're coming from, Nadir, where it's like, um, if you think about it in a very abstract way about the game, like if both players make optimal decisions throughout the game, then the outcome yeah. of the match is always predetermined. Like if, if, if both players play perfectly, then it's always the, the dependent on luck, basically, who wins. Um, yeah. But that's, I mean, obviously, that's a world that we will never live in, where throughout an event, both players will make optimal decisions. Um, yeah. But I think... So in that regard, I don't think that's what differentiates a good format from a bad format. But I think the the what you maybe what's maybe maybe what feels worse to you for this particular format when, for example, you're testing with Gunther is that when you're playing when people gravitate towards um, like eighteen hand traps or whatever it is, right? I think mm, then yep. this sort of comparing hands aspect comes into play a lot more, and the games are also less fun because they're like less interactive in that sense because your hand comparison in that case it takes you like 30 seconds you know you go like normal summon ash mm -hmm. imperm have one extender gets hand trapped as well well i guess i pass opponent normal summon snake eye ash you look at your hand you're like okay don't have a hand trap myself and you're like okay let's wrap mm -hmm. this test game up right here right now right like we it, there's not yep. much <laughs> going on right whereas like yep. in formats that aren't as hand trap heavy like i i imagine if you play test for example an unchained mirror match when both players are on board breakers yep. and you sit down with yep. your with your testing partner there's a lot more going in and a lot more that you that you have to theorize about a lot more different choke points and different different yeah. interactions that are happening rather than just like you know the the sort of like i'm gonna just practice some lines and where to hand trap and how to play through certain hand traps it's relatively dry as opposed to playing those back and forth um, yeah. unchained mirrors, even though an unchained mirror between two really good players also is probably very close to a 50-50. Yeah. 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 That's, that's why it's so, yeah. But I, I guess like for, for sure, like I do, like it is, it does feel good to like feel like the amount of time you put in and you get rewarded for it. So that is for sure. But, but I'll, by the way, I'll, I'll preface all this too. I know like I won this past weekend and everything, but I honestly have to say that I got pretty lucky. Um, like, and the reason why I say this is because like, like things just kind of like worked out my way. Like I was like six card combo with my opponent. I, I didn't drop a match. Actually, I didn't drop a game until the finals, actually. Um, the entire tournament. Um, and I, I, I would say like, it's pretty fortunate that it kind of just worked out that way. Like it honestly was just my day. Like, um, yeah. I think getting to cop cut was way easier because of how prepared we were. I think that like when you finally make it top into top cut, it like, like honestly, like the luck into like matchups, the luck of like, like there's a there's a lot of like factors that also play a part, and I I think like it would be, it would be crazy for me to not say like you know that played a, a big role as well. Like I feel like I did prep really well, and I you know I I did think that we had the best deck in the room for by far, but I I would say that we got like pretty fortunate. Like when I played against the voices guys, I'm like like I beat them in like ten minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like my friend, like Gunther's playing those guys, bro. It's like forty minutes, like into the grinder. Like you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like it's just, yeah. Like I think that's uh, you know, that's just, always like, the case, right? Out. I think if you were to take like, yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying like Yu Gi Oh is luck based or anything like that, yeah. but if you were to like hypothetically like re-simulate Top Cut multiple times, you might find mm -hmm. that there's going to be uh, a couple, a group of players who probably would, in theory, win a million of those simulated YCSs, perhaps like. Yep more often than the people who only go top 32 or something 
Yeah. But yeah, I mean, to win a YC, it does have to be your day, right? But yeah. it's a combination of yeah. luck and opportunity. Um, you create yeah. your luck by yeah. by the play testing, by the deck building, and then if it also happens to be your day, then you do get rewarded for it. Yeah, you need to put yourself yeah. into the position position to do, be able to do well at, in the first place. Yeah, you, you need to go yeah. to multiple tournaments. Like behind behind every tournament win, there's like a bunch of other tournaments you tried but didn't win. Right? It's always like that. And then you yeah. just you just try and and everyone that and whoever puts in more effort and comes in more well prepared than others and like uh, plays better throughout the day just has better odds you know they're not 100 percent likely to to succeed and win a tournament you never are but like the better yep. you are the better you play the better you prepare the better your odds yeah. are right and you'd rather have a two yeah. percent chance of winning a ycs than a 0.01 percent even though both can happen theoretically right um yeah but yeah i mean what you described is like exactly how i felt after bologna as well like still i'm looking back at it and i'm like dude how like <laughs> yeah they're like the 20 impossible. decks and insane. i like you know like it, it's always part of it like yeah. also the fact that like that deck like i got i got what is it what was it labyrinth and top eight and top four like it's just yeah <laughs> yeah i was like damn yeah i remember that event that was that was insane that was insane for sure yeah. i'm trying to keep it as general as possible because um i think we're going to do the deep dive on the specifics of the card choices and stuff like that after vegas because uh of course you want to keep that to yourself um but you were before the podcast started. You were telling us a story about how your you, your team was forming. I don't think you finished that. So who is, oh, who is your team? Yes, yeah. So I'm teaming with Nesh and Sam for um for the Swiss. Nesh, wait, what? <laughs> what? He's going to America? Yeah, we are. We are sending him to the land of the free. Um, <laughs> wait, this is for for next <laughs> week, right? Not for yeah. You you teamed with Kamal no. and Ruben for the. Yeah, so yeah. I teamed with Kamal and Ruben for Costa Rica. I already told them that I wanted to team with Sam and Steven again just to do the run back. You know, first YCS with them. Let's okay. uh, Four years later, let's do another YCS with them and see how it worked out. Yeah. Triff backed out last minute. And so we had to find a replacement. Is he uh, like busy or something? Or Yeah, he had like a lot of work stuff. And I okay. literally got off my plane on Monday. And I'm like checking my phone. And like my, fa my phone's getting blown up by Sam. I'm like, what's going on? And it's like literally like, yo, Steven Bale, we need a team, blah, 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 blah. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I'm imagining Sam's messages right in my head right now. Like he does his 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 YouTube titles, like the best teammate right now just disbanded us or whatever. Like that. But in text form, like through yeah, iMessage. No, like, like the best in all caps, right? Our best teammate just left our team pack. We need to after. find another <laughs> best teammate. Yeah. Sending picture messages I of thumbnails with his punk face. <laughs> <laughs> bro it was rough i literally was scrambling i was like oh my i even hit josh up i was like yeah. Yo, josh bro please i need you <laughs> but yeah he's busy this weekend so it's okay uh yeah so uh like uh like i said we're trying to keep things a little bit more generic uh i think we've got about like 20 minutes plus uh to sure. remaining what kind of direction do you want to take this in do you think josh um i mean we've talked about the I think we can talk a little bit more about what you think this format is going to develop into because obviously now I think it's getting relatively clear that currently the approach is like full send hand traps, right? I'm assuming, I don't want to, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that's roughly from your stories. That's roughly what you did for, for YCS Costa Rica. We don't have to talk about these specific cards, right? Um, from my experience, there's two ways this can go, right? Um, and judging from what you've said earlier, I already have like an assumption of what you what you think about it, but I still want to confirm. Um, there's two ways this can go. Either people realize that that's the only way you can go about it, and then we end up in this sort of format where everyone is just trying to hand trap war each other, and that's not going to feel great in my opinion. That's that's always one of the least fun things in a format that happens when everyone feels like they are obligated to play a hand trap approach a heavy hand trap approach like that's something that you think of usually when that happens it's relatively bad formats because like in something like goki format or whatever like there was no option like you had to hand trap that deck or you wouldn't be able to play the game right and if it does turn into that sort of thing i would also look at snake eyes in a way like i don't think it's going to be a great format if it doesn't matter how interactive the Snake Eye engine in itself is. Um, if half of the half of the decks is dedicated to making your opponent unable to play, that's not really going to show, right? Like the Snake Eye deck can be as interactive as it wants to. If it never gets to play, then it doesn't matter. Um, 
The other way is obviously people start experimenting with more like alternative ways to uh, play into the Snake Eye deck, play into the Snake Eye board. Maybe we see some some board breaker approaches popping up, some some other decks maybe even that have a notoriously good ma matchup going second, uh, those kind of things. So maybe walk me through like how your first instinct of how is this going to develop in the long run after you publish your approach to the deck, what you think mm. is going to what, what do you think is going to happen? I think naturally you just find the approach that beats the current approach. I think that's always how it's been. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it's it's kind of like interesting because we're in a position where, like, obviously, like we're doing well. We post this deck list, and then all of a sudden, that becomes the new approach, right? Yeah. So it's like always trying to stay one step ahead, yeah. right? Like I remember, like in Unchained, uh, in Brazil, I played no hand traps in my list anywhere yeah. in my main or side. I believe I don't even think I had Ash Blossom yeah. <laughs> um, in my decks, um, and. I think it like, you know, made sense for, for the format at the time. So it's always like, you know, trying to stay that one step ahead of everyone else. Um, and so um, I think usually people just gravitate towards the norm is what I would say people, that would, would happen yeah. essentially. Um, but I think like if you want to like do well, you have to like look past that and see like, okay, well, if this is what everyone is doing, well, how do you stand out like among the crowd pretty much? Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think that approach is typically what leads to all of us doing pretty well, right? Like. Yeah. You know, like the Bistro Runic is a good example. Like, you know, you, although obviously it was like you consider it like a really enjoyable deck to play, but yeah. when when you think about the format being, I I I thought it was a great call in my opinion. I, I know like you maybe you didn't intentionally happen to be that way, maybe you did, but the point is that like I think it was a great call because I knew all the top players were on Labyrinth. Like in my opinion, it, it was so more like, like a, it was more like a, yeah. in hindsight I noticed. Whoa, shit! I didn't actually play against many. <laughs> Like there was yeah. a, a, apparently there was no one playing uh, like the the bat matchups for it. Like I mostly hit like Unchained Lab and all that throughout uh, Tier Limits, you know. And I just had yeah. big steals and so. runic cards in my deck. So no, actually, it was it wasn't that intentional because the format was so diverse. I was kind of overwhelmed by it. I didn't actually put the time in that I needed to. But uh, maybe maybe it was some sort of gut feeling. But yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> just the WCD, you know, <laughs> the World Champ Diff. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think like, yeah, those, those are examples of that. Just trying to stay ahead as much as possible, it's, right? So. Yeah, it, the, the way you say it, though, makes it seem easier than it is. Because like in some formats, that's easier said than done. Because I mean, like, what is the next step if the deck just maybe isn't weak to certain board breakers? You know, what can be done in a format yeah. where everyone like... Because in my head, the, the, the task of innovating on this sort of concept is definitely pretty large right now it's hard it's a harder task than at other times because uh yes there's only one deck which usually makes it a little bit easier to innovate on something like that right you think of like tier zero formats where um maybe zodiac comes to mind where other decks were actually capable of exploiting zodiac being relatively tame for a tier zero strategy um but for the current format in my head at least it's like okay the top tier deck if you go with a different approach that's not just um hand trapping then you're basically saying, okay, I'm going to let them make the Snake Eye board. I'm going to try to beat it. But then when everyone is also on 18 hand traps, how do you beat like something that on average is like that board plus one or two hand traps to back it up? Like what, what I don't know. Like uh, even though they don't have Omni yeah. Gaze or something like that, it's a, it's a lot of stuff you need to work your way through. Yeah, no, I already started looking into it actually, funny enough. Yeah. Like I was like thinking about it, I'm like, Man, if I were to, if I wanted to be my own deck, what do I even play? Exactly. <laughs> so I, I, I think, I, I think about that, and I think that's like, that's really the next step after Vegas. That's, that's what I'm gonna be doing. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, when we were watching the UDS, um, I, I was really enjoying the sort of like, gosh, what would you call it? Like the latter t parts of turn one into turn two. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it was like so frustrating to just watch like these constant like hand trap wars, yeah. and it just like i was just watching i was just thinking like this seems awful like i can't believe like this is the approach to the format people have taken which is just like coin flipping on what on w which you know and i like to call them like the underwhelming hand traps that they've opened you know ash imperm valor like the, the ones that are not high impact the ones that stop like a play um it just it felt kind of like terrible um and i was just thinking to myself if, if i was playing this i would have personally if i was going to deck build for an event like this you know here i am saying that you know, I, I'm going to deck build better than a UDS Marfa, champion. undisputed UDS uh, champion. But, like, for me personally, I felt like I would just be full sending, like, board breakers. Dude. Like, I'd be playing, like, Thrust, Shadal Fusion, like, just 
super poly talents. Like, I'd be trying to like do some crazy no. stuff. Shadow like Fusion, that, is, you know what I mean? Yes. I honestly, yo, Shadow Fusion is nasty. You go Shadow Fusion, they have like App Lose Up, right? And with like whatever their board, you can like make App Cologne, chain block it so that like the App Cologne deals with Apollo, the Aerial uh, deals with their entire graveyard. And yeah. then, like, I don't know, my Beast last card, sure. I don't know. They'll just app lose it. It's whatever. Yeah, like, you negate everything. Kind of, kind of stuff I yeah. feel like would be uh, would be good, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. It just it just felt strange. But uh, it, I think, you know, that's sort of the approach that everyone naturally gravitates towards when it's a brand new format. I think this was probably the first, like, fully televised um, new uh, event of the format. Yeah. And it's just, it's just comfortable. It's just, you know, you just 15 hand traps, uh, try and... Um, you know, get lucky essentially with what you're stopping, but also factoring in when you are playing your deck, maybe your Jessies, your packs, your uh, these people, right? Like you'll just be naturally better than the people that you're sitting across at the start of a format because you just play test more and you have mm -hmm. those intricacies of the mirror down. And so it's just more comfortable and safer to just throw out hand traps, right? Like I guess is why people are just so sort of almost, almost like programmed to just, oh, new format, new set. Let's just play some generic stuff. Yeah. No, you definitely brought up some interesting points. Like, for example, the fact that, like, uh, when I'm playing board breakers or whatever, like, I, it's much easier against someone that I'm expecting to maybe misplay some of their interruptions, right? Whereas, like, if I'm preparing for the undisputed UDS championship, I'm like, okay, if my opponent gets to make a full board, they're probably going to use all their stuff in the right order and efficiently, and then maybe it's a lot harder to to break through that. So uh, it's much easier to just have, uh, you know, Jesse hand trap him twice, let him pass the turn, and uh, and then it's not going to... He's he's not... Because when you're using hand traps, you're also taking agency away from, from your opponent, right? Like you're taking some of that stuff away from Jesse that he's not going to be able to utilize in that situation because he's just not been able to play the game, right? So I do understand that at a certain level that that would be something that people would gravitate towards, especially in the beginning of the format. But I think that is going to be, I think it's too early to say whether the format is good or not. I think that's what's going to be decided over time. You know, are people going to come up with, is it going to be possible to innovate through this format or is Snake Eye too oppressive in terms of what it does? Like, is it more a, is it more a like Goki situation where you have no way of innovating? Like the deck's just too powerful. Or is it more of a of an whatever like unchained best deck situation where you can go like hand traps, support breakers to different yeah. approaches, you know? No, I think I think there is a deck. I I would say I if I had to like pick a deck to be like the meta call, I think voices is the deck mm -hmm. for a bunch of reasons. But I think it's voices. I if you had to like pick a deck, um, it's very like in terms of like what it has advantages wise of it can ignore a lot of the hand traps that people are playing like their hands were like you have like that um if you hard open if you open low with like a Sephira, you can play through like you know draw and lockbird you can play through um like pretty much like Valor even right like it's just there's not a lot of ways to even stop that um so i had friends who like even sided out Valor in their mirror match which sounded crazy but um but i think like that deck could be very strong um I think Brandon is another pick, right? Like that I saw Andres Torres play, but I would play Brandon kind of differently than other players. I would play like Brandon with like Shadow Fusion in the main, even um, and like more base, bomb base, base. power cards. Um, but I think like yeah, I think it is possible to innovate um, in in these type of like formats. Uh, I think like I went with just the the fire deck because I just felt like it's just like for the first event. It just like was too powerful to like ignore pretty yeah. much um, because like the format is like still open like it's the start of the format right so yeah. you just play like I think the best deck but I think after it's more defined after lists are more cemented that's when you really get the the quote unquote meta calls and I think that's what I'm I'm looking forward to finding out next yeah. um yeah so you're telling us we're gonna see a sequel to Balling on a Budget uh Fire Fall right <laughs> oh my God bro Dude, Jesse was Balling on a Budget all throughout the the UDS. Yeah, he played one Dia Bell Star. So Dude, no, Jesse, Jesse just deck. Jesse just kept bricking, and like in like one of the top four games, I think he just went for like a ten dollar oh, yeah. combo. Yeah. No, Jesse trolled. I think Jesse trolled. Like Jesse's the goat, but he trolled with one witch. I think that was crazy, in my yeah. opinion. I saw <laughs> that. I'm like, yo, did he just like, like he just like dropped them on the floor and then like rolled over them? Like how, <laughs> where, where, where are the other witches? I think. No, nah, I think in this format you need to like maximize your ways to play. Like it's you don't have that many engine cards. Like, Wasn't um, it like 42 and, cards as well? Yeah, it was about it was 40. 42. It was 42 cards, 
he basically played pure snake eye with fire king as a sub engine like that's basically like he played fire king as non-engine but like mm. they're like terrible non-engine in my opinion so yeah i really yeah i don't like i don't like those uh i don't like that approach but you know um like i think like if you look at it objectively like uh, more of like, oh, he just did well, so it's just like a solid list. It's more about like, does it make sense? And I, I think Jesse, I don't know if Jesse will tell you this. I'll, I'll let him tell you how he got to his own deck list when, when he like streams or, or something. But yeah, like uh, how he even came up with his idea of like how he decide what to play. But I think you'll find that it's not a, um, <laughs> it's not as uh, I guess like critical as you think. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, he'll be uh, on for uh, our listeners here. Uh, we've actually got Jesse scheduled in next week. Yeah. Um, to talk about his UDS and I guess inevitably the uh, three versus three as well. So we're gonna get a, a couple of different perspectives on this format and how it's developing, which is interesting. Um, it's like sort of tangentially uh, related. I'm curious how, how you felt about seeing that they had open deck list for top four. Oh yeah, no, I really don't like that because I think like one of the I think if you had open deck list, I can play around everything. Uh, like mm-hmm. I'm not even trolling. Like I think you can play around everything in the fire decks. Um. And by the Can way, there really are boards like you can... fifteen main hand traps and stuff though. Um, yeah, but like you can you can play a, like if you know your opponent mains Joel, you can sequence to beat Joel. If you point if you know your opponent don't play Joel, you can like completely disrespect it when going first. If you know your opponent is on Nib main deck, you can you can even play around Imperm Nib. Honestly, like you can pick whatever you want to play around. Like if I know all my hand what hand traps my opponent has, I will like play cards to like check for what like for spots in which they should hand trap me. I'll do a mental note of like whatever, like all the cards they could have used in XYZ spots. And then afterwards, like just, you know, like play through all of their hand traps. It, it's like, like, it sounds funny, but I honestly think like, base, it's like, it's ev- everyone's basically playing Infernoble Noble right now. And if you sequence all your hands, right? Like you just beat all these hand traps. I'm not mm-hmm. even like, you can really beat them. It, it depends obviously, because your opponent has to use them in the those right spots and stuff. But, but I think it's there's also combos where like if you know your opponent isn't playing hand traps, like if I play against on just Torres, I will go for like the most ignorant combo with one ash. Like I will disrespect everything, <laughs> die to like one bell, one crow. And but the board I put up is like 10 interruptions. Like you never yeah. win. It's right. So it's... um I think that's why like I really don't like the open deck list thing. And also like the whole like if your opponent has set cards, it's like bro, like. Like what you're citing Fire King Sanctuary? Like come on, I'm saying like come on, like I like like if you're not doing anything, I know like it's probably like it's probably wanted or something, right? So like you can easily like like yeah, I just don't like it because I think it takes a lot of like that critical thinking, like that ability yeah. to like make your opponent second guess. Um, yeah. so it's just like not I don't like it at all in my opinion. And you might you might think like it's fine because it's both players in this case, you know, like both players have yep. access to their opponent's deck lists. I just think. The problem here is that it's in, in, a, in a, especially right now in a hand trap sort of style format, I think it just benefits the player going first way too much, in my opinion. Like, it's not equal. It's not equal information. Like, the, the information yeah. is not equally valuable to both players when well, the player going first right now in game one is just like the one that like needs to worry about it. You yep. know, like the, and it's, it's specifically those cards, like, it's it's crazy how when you're playing a deck like Snake Eye, how much cards like Valor, Imperm, Nibiru, Droll, and Lockbird influence your order and sequencing on the first turn, even if you don't even know your opponent's playing them. You have no idea whether they're in your opponent's deck, but in order to play your turn out optimally, you want to cover for those if possible. And now all of a sudden, I know my opponent's not main decking Nibiru. I can play so much more like ignorant into, into whichever yep. other hand traps they might have or... Um, you know, I know my opponents on board break. We saw that literally in um, in top four of the UDS. We saw like Juan Andrade make the most ignorant board into Andres Torres that could not be super yep. polyed. Like ended on yep. freaking like didn't even put any. What was it? What it, he he ended on exactly like Savage, Baron, and like mm-hmm. Flamberish, like a board that could not be uh, super polyed at all. Super polyed, yep. Uh, yep. And, and it's just like. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe he would have done that uh, just because it was Andres Torres, but like in theory, imagine anyone that wasn't Andres was sitting there, right, and had had their deck list leaked. Yeah. Um, and I, I especially think it's a problem if they didn't announce it beforehand. I have less of an issue if they announced it before the tournament. Then it's just like, oh man, it's the rule of the it's the rule of the tournaments. Build your decks accordingly, right? If you don't want your super poly to be played around, don't put super poly in your deck, maybe. Right, I don't know how that was handled. Right, if that was something that was yeah. announced two months ago, then I'm more fine with it. 
Um, I don't want it to become common practice though. Like I, I would, I would rather. Pretty, oh my uh, god, no! At a YCS, if we have open deck list, I, <laughs> that would be crazy. <laughs> it would be crazy. I think uh, conversely to uh, look at it the opposite way. So um, I, I don't know what Konami's logic was and why they did it because I don't think this is something that's ever happened in Europe. Um, but back in the old ARG days, they used to have open deck list for all of Top Cut, um, mm -hmm. and it was uh, not really something that was criticized or anything back in the day. The logic and the reasoning behind it is, um, you know, just to give you the opposite end of the argument, is that it basically sort of like um, doesn't, you don't really get like rewarded for just being a little bit more interconnected than just having more friends kind of thing, right? Because mm -hmm. typically what can sometimes happen is, yep. oh, here's my pairings for top 16. This is my opponent. Um, I have a friend of a friend who played against this guy. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they nibbed me game one or something, right? Like, so, so rather than just, you know, having people get rewarded for having more friends that walk around mm -hmm. scouting for you before top cut, it just sort of embraces it and just makes it open deck list. So that's so that's sort of like the opposite end of the spectrum for why that <laughs> argument is good is to, mm -hmm. is to prevent yeah. instances of this happening. And I, I mean, what I if do you get, get the that. bozo friend? <laughs> What's the no, bozo I, I, friend? I, the liar? Bro, like <laughs> they're like they're like, yo, he nibby game one. I'm like, huh? I didn't see nib anywhere. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's sometimes the like, all I'm saying is you know there's the bozo friend that be telling you if you were playing all of a sudden like yo they don't have none of those cards in there like, they just, <laughs> they're just like <laughs> it was like game two or something they thought it was game one anyway no I, I, but I get that <laughs> argument I do get that argument I think uh, to be fair though from the perspective of someone where you maybe you would expect like having a lot of connections and stuff like that I don't remember that I don't even I don't even remember the last time that would happen where someone would come up to me before. A top cut match and be like, yeah, your you opponent need to be is friends playing. with a uh, scout fling uh, on his spreadsheets, Josh. Then you'll, uh, you'll, okay, well, you'll, I'm you'll get. That, I'm not on that connection yet. So, but anyways, <laughs> uh, I I think you could circumvent that. I think the biggest deal in that sense is what deck someone's playing, right? Because that's information that's often given out to some people that have maybe know someone who's played them before, right? They'll tell them. Because they'll be able to tell them what deck they played, but they won't know the exact list either, right? They'll maybe remember one or two specific cards, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to tell you, yeah, that guy's on, that guy's on cross out nib, uh, and that that's all their non engine, right? But like, for the most part, what you would get is know which deck they're playing, which maybe can influence your place. I wouldn't mind if they posted, like for example, standings of a YCS with the deck. Uh, clarification next to it i think that'd be okay right it would also take away some uh disadvantages for people that had some feature matches because it's like it's one thing to go and check someone's previous feature match to see what deck they played before you face them in like five minutes uh you can easily check what they played you can't check you can't scroll through a 40 minute match to see all the cards <laughs> they played right you know you know what's so funny josh that you mentioned that i remember in bologna before we played like top air or something i i like literally looked at my opponent watching my future match yeah <laughs> like, i was like oh i'm like i'm like oh, like, oh that's that's me <laughs> we were watching my deck profile and my and my future match against josh earlier <laughs> that is yeah. hilarious and I, I was looking like mm, uh, uh i guess like yeah that's fair. <laughs> it's like a tony hawk moment right there you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought it was really funny. I mean, like, I, I don't mind it. I'm like, I mean, I got featured. This is what it is, right? Like, I mean, it's I, not, I don't mind it's, not uh, it's not uh, against the rules to watch a feature match. So it's like, I mean, obviously he's going to do it, yeah. right? But... Yeah, I just thought it was like really funny um, seeing literally myself playing you <laughs> next to you. Well, at my, uh, yeah, it was a Eureka moment. Like, was it like waiting for top eight interviews? He's just sitting next to you. We're all in the same yeah. area and he's just got the feature yep. match running. Nice. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, nice. <laughs> All right. I uh, have to dip a little bit soonish. Uh, so okay. is there any uh, subjects or topics that you wanted to bring up at all, Pac, that you maybe prepared for that we didn't talk about? Was there anything you wanted to go over um, at all, perhaps? Yeah, the biggest topic. I'll, I'll say this before we leave. Um, I did, This is, like, really important. Uh, is for all in aspiring duelists out there, don't get discouraged. Like, I started my Yu-Gi-Oh! journey not topping, like, the first five, six Maybe it'd been seven. Damn, I I, I wanted to lose I track. I remember okay? this period. Like, <laughs> you were, you, uh, you did really well. You know, I was following you for a bit, and like you were constantly yep. bubbling for like a season and a half. It was it was crazy. Like yeah. every event, you were literally ex. Uh, you were you were hitting like those uh and that, those. I lost matches. day two, second round every time, and I honestly they're all my fault. I'll tell you that right now. So it's not don't don't like get it missed. Like 
uh, misguided. That's like luck based. It's, a lot of it, I look back. It's a lot of it's my fault. But but my point is like, don't be discouraged. Like if you want to get better at the game, if you want to do well, just keep going. Um, you will get there. Maybe it takes longer for you than others, but I would say like you got you can't stop just because you don't do well. Um, because I think that would be a disservice to yourself. You know, maybe you never get to see how well you really go. So I think that's the biggest thing. But that's it. That's it for me. All right. Uh, Josh, any uh, closing statements or anything? Uh, no, I was thinking for this episode in particular, maybe if we have, I don't know how, how urgent it is that we need to finish this thing off, but if we have a couple more minutes, I think it's always cool if we have a guest to have some live questions in there. I saw some people post some questions earlier already. If you could maybe repeat them, maybe we can yeah, have a pack a answer. There centric questions here, because uh, I think I specifically picked out the top four decklist one, um, open decklist thing for you, so... Um, any oh, this is an Eric Master you. has an interesting one for pack, yep. which I actually forgot to ask. Any tips how to play and prepare for a three v three compared to a one v one? Like, what is so special about it? I actually need. I actually wanted to ask that question. I forgot about it because we never yeah. have three v threes in in Europe. So tell me about it. No, Get on no Discord, so I think this. Is really... <laughs> <laughs> What's really important about three v threes is that like um. So, like, you're able to take more risks in your deck building. I think that's, like, the number one thing because you are able to mitigate each other's risks by... Because you only need to win two out of three. Um, so that's the number one. The number two, which is... This is what Kamal does really well, is when... If one of the teammates is completely losing, he ignores them completely and focuses on the person who, like, can win, right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if Ruben is losing. If I win my match and Kamal won his, we win the match. So it's, like, knowing when to concede positions that... Or like you know, not help someone that is in losing positions. I mm -hmm. think like a lot of people get stuck and try to like salvage like the impossible, but it's like make so do, do you, with do what you mean. You just literally can. like stop playing their game and just like focus on the other and just like just yes. full and like coaching. Yeah, yeah, like like uh, in in uh, I remember that in Brazil, uh, Ruben was completely losing. It was me. Kamal won his match already, and it was just me on on the left side, and I was like playing my match. He looks over to Ruben, he's looking at the game state, he's like, yep, this is lost. Goes over to me, and then just completely focuses on my game and, like, just wins that match. Because, like, at the end of the day, we have to focus on winning the match that's actually winnable, right? So it's, like, being able to determine which game states are winnable and which ones are not. And, like, pivoting, I think that's, like, really important in 3v3. So, like, if you're the player in the middle, I feel like that's, like, your, your one, that's your role, pretty much, right? You can't help two players at once. So, it's like, where do you divert your attention um, is, like, really important, I think. Um, and then also, I think the other aspect that's really nice is, uh, like, the, the coaching aspect, right? Like, you have to, like, understand how to, like, communicate with each other. And it's, like, a really hard skill. <clears throat> I think this time we communicate a lot better. Um, but definitely, like, it takes a while. Like, so I think, like, like you need really strong communication. What like, specifically um, are you referring to in communication? Yeah, so, like, for instance, like, if someone's like, hey, which card do I start with, right? And it's like... You have to say stuff. I think, like, the, the way I always say this is, like, you know, if you want to play around this card, you do this first. If you want to play around that, you do that first or something like that. You know, just making it clear, like, you know, giving them their options and then let them they go with, like, their, their gut instance or something like that, right? So yeah. it's, like, mm -hmm. just kind of, like, communicating and put them in the position to sort of, like, they... Because I think, like, full coaching is, like, fake because, like, you never can actually play two matches at once. Yeah. I, I don't think that's actually possible. But I yeah. think, like, you can guide your teammate to think critically about what decisions they should make and then whatever they make at the end of the day like you know they go for it right so yeah, yeah. i was about to say and it then, seems really hard to completely yep. take over someone's game for them no yeah yep all right um i don't think i picked up anything else i suppose uh anything specific you're looking forward to in terms of a uh, new deck um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to the, the Josh reactions. Uh, how many QCRs we got in the deck this time? <laughs> oh, God, they have a gamble. There, there's going to be a gamble running, yeah. Let, let me know yeah. when the deck profile pro drops because we're going to have a... <laughs> I, I still find it crazy how misguided you are on the, on the QCRs, dude. Oh, oh, the ultimators are definitely better. I'm just... They're okay. just a match. And I'm okay, like, good. I'm, 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 okay, you're just, okay, you're just playing in the, into the meme, I see. Okay. Yeah, they just all look... Right. They just look... Um, they just match, that's all. So. <laughs> Thank you All so right. much, everyone, for uh, listening and uh, tuning into this episode. Uh, this is our first ever um, podcast and episode featuring a guest. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, we're still reading all the comments and taking in the feedback where possible. And uh, if you have any feedback for future episodes featuring guests, uh, we'd love to know how you enjoyed the dynamic, anything we you would like to see improved with the structure, um, 
camera setup, anything like that. Generically, uh, you know, we're happy to take uh, take some notes there. So yeah, um, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, as I mentioned midway through, the next episode will be featuring Jesse as well, going over the UDS, and we'll get to do a bit more of a deeper dive into specifics on deck lists and deck building for yeah. this format. Just because, uh, as mentioned, Pac is uh, obviously preparing for another tournament this weekend, so uh, things have to be kept a little bit on the DL. And, uh, you know, uh, Pac, give us your shoutouts. I think there's a lot of things you wanted mm -hmm. to mention for the socials before you head off. Um, nope, just, just YouTube and Twitch, I guess. So Pac TZG. That's it. Yep. You're going to find, you're going to find Pac's links in the description if you're watching on YouTube. And, um, thank you so much for hopping on. It was a pleasure to have you. And, uh, yeah. thank you guys for <clears throat> listening. Big fan. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thank you. Bye, chat. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.